So today we're honored to welcome Christian Picciolini. He has quite a story. He's an Emmy award-winning television producer, a prolific public speaker, and a reformed extremist. He's here today to talk about his work as the co-founder of Life After Hate, a nonprofit helping people disengage from hate and violent extremism. He's also the author of Romantic Violence, Memoirs of an American Skinhead. Christian's life purpose is really born from an ongoing and a profound need to atone for his grisly past and to contribute to the greater good. He began the process of rebuilding his life after leaving violent far-right extremist groups that he was a part of during his youth. And he went on to earn a degree in international relations from DePaul University and start his own global entertainment company. He was appointed a member of the Chicago Grammy Rock Music Committee and a board member of SimFest. I always try to say that, but I don't get it right. Chicago International Movies and Music Festival. It's pretty awesome. So Christian's an appointed United Nations affiliated ambassador for iChange Nations and was honored with the National Statesman Award. He's also an associate for the USC Pride Homegrown Violent Extremism Program that I think you might be going into in your talk. And most recently, Christian won an Emmy Award for directing and producing Exit USA's There Is Life After Hate PSA. And he's been nominated for multiple regional awards. And uh, Christian's gonna be sticking around today for the talk, uh, after the talk, and we'll have copies of his book, Life After Hate, uh, uh, um, Romantic Violence, available for $10 out in the lobby. So for Googlers in the audience, be sure to think of any questions you might have for Christian during the Q&A. So now, please give a warm Google welcome to Christian Picciolini. Hi, everybody. You know, I remember my wife was sitting over there, in case you didn't know, but I remember when I used to see every person who worked at the Chicago office could fit in this front row here. <laughs> Not quite like that anymore. Josh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's good to be back. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, my journey here started 22 years ago in 1995 when I left the American neo-Nazi skinhead movement that I helped build. I was 22 at the time, but I had already spent eight years, every one of my formative teen years from the time I was 14 years old, in America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang. But before that, I was a pretty normal kid. Chachi, I guess, is right, you know. Right? <laughs> I came from an Italian immigrant family who came to the United States uh, in the mid-60s. Uh, I was, had low self-esteem, low self-confidence. I liked to play sports. I was just a normal teenage kid. But because my parents were immigrants, they had to work very long hours. Uh, and they were gone at their small business that they started seven days a week, 14 hours a day. And I spent a lot of time on my own. In fact, I felt very lonely and felt very abandoned at a young age. I didn't quite fit in into the Italian community where I was growing up. And I didn't quite fit in into the American community because my family really held on uh, to kind of the old world ways. So it never really crossed over. So I, because of that, I didn't have a lot of friends growing up, uh, and I felt very marginalized. And just like any other teenager, just like any other human being, really, there were three fundamental needs that I was searching for. Identity, community, and a sense of purpose. And that's something that we all search for at a young age, typically. One day, when I was 14 years old, uh, and I was angry at my parents and angry at the world, uh, I was standing in an alley, smoking a joint, and a car, a 1968 Firebird, came roaring down the alley, spitting up gravel and rocks, and it stopped six inches from me. And a man with a shaved head got out of the car and boots, and nobody really in America knew what a skinhead was in 1987. This was before Geraldo got his nose broken with a chair, and before they were on Oprah Winfrey. But this man came up to me and he grabbed the joint from my mouth and he was 26 years old at the time and I was 14. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile? I was 14, I didn't really know what a communist was except for Ivan Drago in my favorite Rocky movie. Uh, I didn't know if I'd met a Jewish person 
I wouldn't have known by that point. And I hardly knew what the word docile meant. But I was struck with this man's charisma. It seemed like he was the only adult at that time in my life that had given me a reason, a real reason, not to do something that would harm me. Whereas my parents might say, don't do that because it's stupid, or don't do that because what will other people think if they see you doing that? Though I didn't understand his logic because I didn't understand politics at 14 years old, it seemed like he had an insight that should be important to me. And he drew me in into this community which happened to be America's first neo-Nazi skinhead group. Started on the south side of Chicago. Most people don't know that. About two years, ago, uh, two years after I was recruited, uh, that man went to prison for a series of very violent hate crimes, uh, with the last one being uh, against a female skinhead that was part of our crew. They saw her standing at a bus stop with a black man, and they went to her apartment, and they kicked in her door, and they pistol whipped her until they thought she was dead, and then before they left, they painted a swastika on her wall with her own blood. And luckily for that, uh, they were arrested, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Unlucky for me, that left a void in this organization. By this time, I was 16 years old. I had learned how to recruit. I had bought into the ideology, which was very much an us against them narrative. It was always about blaming somebody else for the problems that existed in your life versus taking accountability for those problems and blaming somebody else because it was very easy to blame the other, the invisible other person. And I started to teach that to other people. And when he went to prison, there was an opportunity for me that changed my life. Uh, I essentially stepped into the role of leadership of this group at 16 years old. And I went from Chachi to this guy pretty much overnight. As part of my job to recruit more young people, uh, I had to use fear tactics. Our way of recruiting people was to scare them, to essentially tell them that people were coming into our neighborhoods to steal, who were black, who were Latino. Uh, we would say things like, the Jews control the media and finance systems and uh, entertainment. Uh, we would say that immigrants were coming to our country and stealing jobs. Sound familiar? Not much has changed over the last 30 years, uh, and I'll get into that. But I started to recruit these people, and I started to affect their lives. And for the first time in my life, I felt powerful in the false sense of the word. But I, felt, I had felt powerless my whole life before that. So for a 16-year-old kid, or even a 14-year-old kid, to now be a part of this very you know, powerful, uh, perceived power community, it really kind of changed my life, and I started to come out of my shell. And I started to encourage young people to go out and commit acts of violence. And what I realize now that I didn't realize then is that I really hated myself, and what I was doing was projecting my own self-loathing onto other people to relieve myself of that pain. Unfortunately, it took me many years to figure that out. I had started to become a regional leader around that time. I merged our small group, which was the first, into a larger group called the Hammerskin Nation, which today is still the most violent and deadliest skinhead organization on Earth. It is now all over the world. Uh, and I also started a band that was a white power band. My goal with that was to encourage people through my lyrics and my music to join our fight. And it was propaganda, in the truest sense of the word. And it was also our version of fake news back then. This was before the internet, so I started to tell people through my lyrics to go out and commit acts of violence, which they did. I gave them propaganda as education, which they learned. And that kept them in because what would happen is they would give up everything else in their life that was important to them to join this group. And that was important for us because we knew then it was harder to leave and harder to go back. Because they'd abandoned their original identity and their original community, and we gave that to them in a new form. But we also gave them that purpose that they were looking for. But we would always try to look for young people who were marginalized or vulnerable or who had some sort of a grievance or trauma 
because they were looking for answers and they were angry and it was easy for us to manufacture answers for them. To spin something into an answer that was more palatable for them so that they would blame other people. In 1991, the band that I started to make this music was the first band to travel outside of the United States within this genre uh, to play in a foreign country. And this was in 1991 in Weimar, Germany. And Weimar is this beautiful uh, city that is in former East Germany. It's produced uh, composers and, and artists and great thinkers. And this was the first time that I really recognized the consequences of my words that I was saying on stage. Because after this concert, the 4,000 skinheads that came to the show from all over Europe went out into this town and they essentially destroyed it. They broke into shops and they broke windows, they stole beer from pubs, and they went around the town essentially beating up the townspeople who were white and German. And I didn't quite understand why we were doing that. And I didn't quite understand how it made me feel that they were doing that based on my words. And it really allowed me to have this internal discussion with myself to really try and understand what I was accomplishing and how I was influencing the world. And I had a really hard time with that. And I started to question the ideology that I was a part of. I started to see that they were broken people who were hurting other people because they were broken. And that's when I made the connection about me feeling broken and hating myself and then projecting that onto other people. And then something happened. It changed my life again. When I came home from Germany, I met a girl and we fell in love. Not her, somebody else. <laughs> and we had our child and I was 19 years old when we first got married and had our first child and then 21 when we had our second son. And it challenged that, that idea of identity and community and purpose. I had gone from a skinhead leader to a father. My community priority shifted from the one I had built around me to the family I was now creating. And my purpose began to shift. It was about supporting my family and keeping them safe and providing for them and not bringing in the ideology that I was a part of. And that was an important key for me because I started to ask myself, if I'm passionate about this, why is it that I'm not bringing my family into it? And I realized at that point that it was not something I, want them, I wanted them involved in because it was dangerous. I had started to question my ideology and I'd started to meet people that challenged my narrative. So to support my family, I opened a record store. I still wasn't ready or brave enough to leave behind that community and that identity because I had really abandoned everything else and my family was very new. So I decided the best way to find a middle ground was to get off the streets and open a record store. That way I could support my family, that way I could come home in normal hours and I wouldn't be putting myself in danger. But the point of opening the record store was not just to sell music, it was to sell white power music. So I began importing CDs, and this was before the internet, from Europe, and very, very quickly it became 75% of my gross revenue at the store. People were driving in from California and New York to buy this white power music because I was the only store in the US selling it. Something else happened at that time. I became a little bit greedy as an entrepreneur, and I thought to myself, why should I just take money from my brothers and sisters when I could be taking money from the enemy as well? So I started to sell punk rock and hip hop and heavy metal. And when the customers came in to buy that, who were African American or Jewish or gay or Muslim, at first I was a little standoffish. I was happy to take their money, but I didn't really want to talk to them or engage with them. But they kept coming back. And they knew who I was, and I was confused why they were supporting me. And every time they came back, the conversation got to be a little bit more personal. And then they would come back. And then I started asking them questions. And one day, a black teenager came in, and he had told me that his mother had passed from cancer. And suddenly I was able to relate 
with this person because my mother had been diagnosed with cancer. And we connected on a human level. And then one day, a gay couple came in with their son, and it was obvious how much they loved him, and it was the same love that I felt for my child. And I began to realize that we had more similarities than differences, that I had never in my life, not just the eight years that I was involved, but never in my life, had a meaningful conversation or interaction with anybody who wasn't like me. And because of my store, I was now having these meaningful interactions with the people who in my head, I had a different vision of who they were. I believed the propaganda, I believed the hate and the lies and the scapegoating, and now suddenly I was meeting these people for the first time, and they showed me compassion. They could have easily gone and broken my windows at the store, they could have easily gone and threatened my family or harmed me, but they didn't. Even though they knew who I was, they kept coming back. And I received compassion from the people that I least deserved it from when I least deserved it. And that really allowed me to humanize them and realize that we needed each other, that we had the same fundamental needs of joy and love, that we had the same emotions of anger and sadness, and that we really were all pieces of a puzzle that couldn't be built without each other. So I became embarrassed to sell the white power music and I closed the store, obviously, because I couldn't sustain it anymore with it being 75% of my revenue. And at that same moment when I closed my store, my life fell apart. I didn't have a job anymore, so my livelihood was gone. My wife and my children left me because I hadn't left the movement quickly enough and paid attention to them. I didn't have a great relationship with my parents and I had lost my whole community that I built. So suddenly I was without that identity and that community and that purpose. And for the next five years, I woke up every morning and I considered taking my life because I wasn't sure how to proceed. I was treating other people with respect. I started to understand our similarities, but I was still miserable inside. Because for those five years, I tried to outrun who I was. I tried to make new friends, wasn't very successful at that. I moved, wore long sleeves to cover my tattoos. I was doing everything I could to not face who I was because I was afraid of being judged just like I judged other people. Until one day, at the end of that five years, a friend of mine came up to me and she said, you have to do something because I don't wanna lose you. And I said, okay, well, what do you suggest? And she said, well, I just started working at this company called IBM, you may have heard of them. Why don't you apply for a job there? And I said, you're crazy. I said, I'm like an ex-Nazi, I'm covered in tattoos, I went to six high schools, I got kicked out of all of them, one of them twice, I didn't go to university. Oh, and by the way, I don't own a computer or know how to use a computer. Why would they hire me? And she said, just, just go in there for an interview, see what happens, and just tell them you're good with people. I was like, yeah, okay, that's what I'm gonna tell them. But I wrote my resume, I lied on my resume, and I went in and I got the job. And that essentially changed my life again. Because now I had found purpose again. That gave me the ability to find the confidence, to approach other people, to seek forgiveness, but also to find a way to forgive myself because I had been unable to do that. And things started to get better. And the first day at IBM, of course they have millions of customers, where did they put me? Back at my old high school for a computer rollout, the same high school I'd been kicked out of twice. That was my first day and my first job <laughs> at IBM. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. I was a grown man who was sweating and shaking and I couldn't find the words. I was scared to walk into the building because I was afraid that somebody was gonna say, we know him, he's gotta go. And I would lose that opportunity for that first meaningful thing. And of course, on that first day, who walks by me but the old black security guard that I got in a fist fight with that got me kicked out for the second time. I really didn't know what to do then, but I decided I had to do something. 
I knew I couldn't live in that fear of being found out or recognized and fired. So I decided I was going to chase him to the parking lot. Probably not the smartest thing for a guy that I got in a fist fight with. But when I saw him getting into his car, I tapped him on the shoulder. And this man who normally had this beautiful, jolly smile, when he turned around and recognized me, he took a step back because he was afraid. I couldn't think of what to say except, I'm sorry. And I stuck out my hand, and he shook it, and we talked, we embraced. We may have cried just a little bit. It was a long time ago. I'm not really <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure we cried. But after talking, he made me make a promise, and that promise was that I would tell the world my story, not because he, you know, thought, oh, kids are going to become neo-Nazis, you should tell them. But because he recognized in my story the story of every young person who's vulnerable, who's marginalized, who can very easily find a destructive path. I didn't really know what he meant until a couple years later. Uh, and I got a phone call in 2004 in the middle of the night that my younger brother had been shot and killed. And then I knew that I had to tell my story. Because he was driving in a car with some friends in a neighborhood he wasn't used to. And some kids who were scared of his skin color decided that they were going to shoot into the car. And I knew that this wasn't just something that affected me. I knew then at, the, at this time that I wasn't the only one with this problem, that there were a lot of lost young people who needed to understand that there was a more positive path. So it took me 10 years to do it, but eventually I wrote and published my book. Uh, and in my book, I speak to every young person. While I use my own story and I tell my story, I use the language that I used at that age because I want other young people to be able to relate to what I went through, and I think that I was successful with that. I also co-founded an organization called Life After Hate, uh, and everybody you see in this picture here is a former extremist who's been out for at least the last 20 years and has dedicated their lives to helping dismantle what they helped build. For the last 22 years of my life, Mostly for the last 15, I've been very actively engaged in helping people understand the movement that I helped build. I've consulted with law enforcement and done public speaking. But most of all, what I'm the most proud of is helping people disengage from hate and hate groups. And we're able to be successful doing that because we really relate to the people we're working with. We were those people at one point in our lives. And what we do when we work with people is we listen. And we listen for what I call potholes. Potholes are the things that appeared in your path, that happened to you, that eventually deviated you onto a different path. And when I listen for potholes, I hear about trauma and abuse, poverty, lack of education, mental illness. And my job then becomes to fill those potholes. I work with partners all over the country to uh, bring mental health support or job training or career guidance uh, or education, even tattoo removal for people who are in these movements who want to get out. And I tell you that there are so many people who are stuck in these movements, and even though they may be questioning their ideology, they don't leave because they've already abandoned everything to go back to. And they've spent time and energy building this community and this identity that starting over is very, very difficult. And I know because I was there. So we try to be this new community for them. We've actually built a network of over 200 people that we've helped leave, uh, that have found us after they've left. And we provide a virtual support system for them. They can talk to each other and understand each other. And some days in our, in our virtual community, you know, it's cat memes and joking around. And some days it gets really heavy where somebody will admit for the first time to anybody that they were abused, sexually abused at three years old. Or they'll come online and tell us that their son committed suicide that morning. And we rally. We surround that person with love and with compassion and empathy, and they make it. Because sometimes the things that they're going through because of their past, it's not something that they feel comfortable talking about 
with other people that haven't experienced it. I just want to talk a little bit about the movement now uh, because it's changed over the last 30 years. What we used to think of when we thought of the far-right extremist movement, we think of skinheads and Klan and, and militia. And there are still people out there like that. We see them on the news from time to time. But it's different now. The internet has changed things. And this is an important topic for me, and I'm glad I'm speaking to you about this, because obviously you are at the fore of this thing called the internet and connecting people and information. But what I've seen lately, because of the internet, is that so many vulnerable young people who may be socially awkward in real life are finding their identity and their community online in not the greatest of places. I'm seeing so much propaganda and fake news that is directing these young people to a new narrative. Because let's face it, young people, maybe even some of us, we're pretty disgruntled with the way society is these days. We question government. We question law enforcement on some of their tactics. You know, For young people, they have a hard time getting a job after college. If they go to college, they're saddled with debt. They're really looking for answers. And unfortunately, because of some of the algorithms that exist online, it traps people in these bubbles and puts them down a rabbit hole. Let's say, for instance, you click on a story about black, or you Google a black on white crime statistics. Well, that may take you to a fake news site, and I know that you all are working on that, and I'm glad that you guys are, but this is important, because what happens is when they hit that news story, just like when you go to Amazon and you buy a product and it recommends you know, Pampers if you bought Huggies, well, Unfortunately, social media also recommends the same type of story, so you start going down this rabbit hole of misinformation. So what used to look like this, now looks like this. And we might laugh and say, oh, you know, they're just teenage girls being stupid. They also look like this. 30 years ago, we started this concept of what's called the alt-right today. We recognized 30 years ago that we were turning people away, the average American racist, because we had shaved heads and waved swastika flags and got tattoos. So we thought, well, we need to trade in our boots for suits. We need to start wearing a tie and going to college so we can recruit on college campuses. We need to get jobs in law enforcement and run for office. And it's getting younger and younger And it manifests like this. This is Dylan Roof, who walked into a church in South Carolina and murdered nine innocent people because of the color of their skin. One day, he went and he looked up black on white crime statistics, and he was led to a website that is a white nationalist or neo-Nazi website that gave false information. And he continued to go down that rabbit hole, and we all unfortunately know what happened in that tragedy. Alexander Bissonnette, Quebec City, same situation. Murdered six people who were praying in a mosque because of propaganda and online misinformation. James Jackson, just a couple weeks ago in New York City, went and murdered a black man and tried to stop interracial relationships because of the things he was reading online. Really happy that this one was classified as terrorism, and it's only the second time that white extremism has been classified as terrorism in the United States. The first one was the Oklahoma City bombing with Timothy McVeigh, who was an avid attendee at Aryan Nations. Without the resources of calling it terrorism, I'm afraid and I'm alarmed that we will not be able to combat it the way it needs to. Since 9-11, most of you may not know this, but more Americans have been killed on US soil by white extremists than by any other foreign or domestic terrorist group combined by a factor of two. Yet we still don't call it terrorism. We hardly hear about it on the news unless it's a you know, very high profile attack. So what I decided to do because of all the influence online for young people. 
was that we were going to start doing interventions online. So we launched an initiative called ExitUSA.org, uh, and it's just a simple website. It's just a contact form where people can contact us confidentially and without judgment if they want help leaving these groups. As you can imagine, sometimes it's a dangerous uh, thing to do to leave. Uh, they're also kind of testing the waters to make sure that they can trust us uh, because they're afraid that we may be law enforcement or turning them in. Uh, and when we establish that rapport with people, we've had almost a 100% success rate of helping people disengage. I just want to tell you a little bit, oh, actually, what I want to do is one of the initiatives that we launched online with the help of YouTube that I'm very, very proud of was, uh, and thanks, Josh, who just left for a call, that's what I won an Emmy for, so I'm very proud of it. This is a one-minute PSA that I'd love to show you that we actually ran on YouTube in front of hate videos as a non-clickable ad, so you couldn't remove the ad. You had to watch it. So we were essentially making these people who were in this movement watch our video ad before they watched a propaganda video. Can we play that? I was out there that night, drunk, stupid, and looking for a fight. When my mom found out I was gay, I was 13 years old. She threw me out of the front door, locking it behind her, and that's the last time I ever saw my mom. Someone yelled, get the faggot. I kicked him in the head and watched it snap back. I remember looking into those eyes. The moment I saw him again, I had to think, can I forgive him? I spent half my life thinking that I killed him. I feared what I didn't understand, and that fear turned to hate and violence. Hate is like a cancer that will eat you alive. Until there's nothing left to forgive. If you or someone you know is in the dark world that hate takes you to, we can help. No judgment, just help. We were very successful with that ad. We ran it for only three weeks, uh, and the Wall Street Journal actually ended up writing an article about it because just in those three weeks, eight people reached out to us uh, that we've helped disengage uh, from these movements. I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the cases that I'm seeing, and I think this is also important. This is Grace. Grace is a 17-year-old girl from Florida. Her parents contacted me through Exit USA, and they said, we're concerned about our daughter. She's making these neo-Nazi propaganda videos. Uh, they're horrifying. And she has this 23-year-old boyfriend who lives in Idaho uh, who essentially recruited her and is writing the scripts for these videos. So I started to dig in. I got a little information uh, on both the girl and her boyfriend just so I could do some research about what I was getting myself into. Uh, and I had an email and a name and, a, and an address, and I started to, for about three weeks, go really deep into uh, a rabbit hole, uh, a really fascinating rabbit hole. What I discovered was that this man was not only doing this to her, but he was doing it to 12 other girls at the same time, uh, some as young as 14 years old. He would become their boyfriends. Uh, he would only communicate with them over the phone or through email or text message. He would do Skype sessions without the video. Uh, and if he would send a video, it was obvious to me when I looked at it that it was somebody else's video that he had stripped the audio uh, and recorded his own audio on. Uh, I was able to do reverse image searches on Google, thank you very much, uh, to actually find out which original pictures uh, he had used and altered as his own. So when I presented to this girl and her family, what I discovered was that this man was not a 23-year-old boy from Idaho. He was actually a 37-year-old man from Moscow, Russia. And another, uh, the rest of his group around him that was also working uh, to spread propaganda in the white nationalist movement had created over 100,000 social media profiles uh, that were using chatbots and artificial intelligence uh, to put out misinformation, but also to engage in conversation with people. Uh, those uh, accounts were pro-Trump and also very neo-Nazi at the same time. They were fake accounts that were just uh, being, uh, technology was kind of propagating these messages. But they were also creating fake Black Lives Matters accounts and fake jihadist accounts. 
all with the purpose of trying to put out misinformation against each other to rile up everybody else. Eventually turned over that information to the FBI, and when I met with the girl and her parents, of course she didn't believe me because this was her boyfriend, so she leaked the information to him, and within an hour of me leaving her house, uh, 75 domain names that I own for my nonprofit, my business, my mother's business, friends, were all hacked by Russian malware and pointed to uh, porn sites in Russia. So our, our sites were shut down for a couple weeks. I'm happy to say that I've been working with Grace for about seven months. Uh, what I've done with her is I've uh, immersed her into situations where she is connecting with people that she thought she hated. I introduced her to a 96-year-old female Auschwitz survivor uh, who is now her mentor, and they're really good friends, and they talk all the time. They bonded over playing the violin. And uh, it's those situations of meeting the people that you keep outside of your social circle and understanding them and having a meaningful interaction that really changes people's perspective because the ideology is not a driver. It's community, it's identity, it's that sense of purpose. The ideology is just a tie that binds them together and gives them license to be angry. And I can tell you that there are striking parallels between why people join ISIS, why they join a white nationalist movement, or even why they join a gang. And we're starting to understand those connections, that it really is not necessarily driven by ideology, that it's actually the need to belong to something that makes them vulnerable to the ideology. I also want to tell you about Daryl. Daryl is a 31-year-old uh, man from Buffalo, New York. He called me after reading my book, and he said, I have some questions. I said, OK. So I talked to him for several weeks. Uh, and then one day, uh, he told me that he saw a Muslim man praying in the park when he was walking his daughter, and uh, walking with his daughter. And all he wanted to do was go up to that man and kick him in the face when he was on the ground praying. I said, okay, Daryl, well, I'm flying to Buffalo tomorrow. I don't know what you're doing, but you're taking the day off because we really need to talk. And when I got there, I asked him, the first question I asked him was, have you ever met a Muslim person before? And he said, no. Why would I want to do that? They're, they're evil. They're the enemy, and I don't want to be anywhere near them. And I said, okay. I excused myself. I went to the bathroom. I got out my phone, and I Googled the local mosque in town, and you know, I was very quiet in the bathroom, and I got on my phone, and I called. And I said, Imam, I have a man here who is a Christian. He would really love to learn more about your religion. <laughs> Can I bring him over? And he said, yes, absolutely bring him over. I'd be happy to talk, but I've only got 15 minutes. I'm preparing for a prayer service. I said, OK, we'll be right over. When we got there, we had 10 minutes left, and I knocked on the door. And the Imam answered, and he said, I've only got 10 minutes, but please come in and talk. Well, three hours later, we left the mosque after sitting down and discussing religion and talking about all the things that were in this man's head that he didn't, uh, it wasn't really connected to any reality or logic or rationale. It wasn't long before they were hugging and crying. And I'm happy to say that now, Daryl goes to the mosque. Uh, he's still a Christian, but he volunteers there. He helps set up chairs. Uh, he cooks food for them. And every Friday, he and the imam go out for falafel. They're now very, very good friends. Um, and Daryl is doing great as well. Anybody can change. What I'm trying to say is that it's the compassion and the empathy that we give to those people that we despise, that we hate what they say, that changes them. Here's another example. I don't know if you know who Richard Spencer is. I'm sure you've heard his name recently. But I was giving a talk last week in Whitefish, Montana, in his hometown. And I sent him a direct message on Twitter. And I said, hey, I'm in your town. Let's grab a coffee. And he happened to come to my talk that night. We spoke for two hours afterwards. And we just talked. We didn't battle ideologically. I listened. And I listened for those potholes. And of course, I didn't change Richard Spencer. He still hates people. He's still pushing this alt-right agenda. But I heard things that will develop into something else over time. I heard things about those voids, those potholes in his life. And we've agreed to meet again. And I think it's 
a seed has been planted, at least it's a good sign that he gave the peace sign. Um, but I'm going to continue talking to him. Uh, while other people want to punch him, I can tell you that when I was 18 years old, if somebody would have punched me because of my beliefs, I probably would have come back with something a little bit more than a punch. Uh, that doesn't change anybody. I know our initial reaction is to want to eliminate and get rid of the people who are dissenting or say things that we don't like. And I'm here to tell you that we need to listen to them despite how it makes us feel because we need to establish that human connection again. That's what helped me change, and that's what I believe will help change people who are still stuck in this movement. I have a challenge for you before we open it up for questions. I want you to leave today, and when you leave, I want you to do something. And that's find somebody who you think doesn't deserve a kind word, and I want you to give it to them or a kind action, show them compassion, and see what happens. See how you change, and see how it changes them. So I want you to go out there, and it's, my motto is kind of similar to Google's, the do no evil. Mine is make good happen. So I want you to go out there, and I would love for you to make good happen. Thank you very much. And I think there's a microphone there. Um, I don't know if we can see the Dory questions on here too, if there's any that come up. But please, if you have a question, step up to the microphone and I'm happy to answer it. And you can ask anything as personal as you'd like. And I promise to answer it as honestly as possible. Hi, Christian, great talk. Hi. Um, what is your take on um, this casual kind of racism we're seeing that it's not exactly you know punching in the face and it's not exactly dressing up and going to college as a racist or running for office but it's like this kind of lame casual commenting that I see yeah. like even teens people we wouldn't assume anymore to be be like this anymore doing what what do you think about that or how do we change something like that first of all I think it was likely always there right it was probably dormant, lived in the shadows, and because of you know, our political climate, uh, a lot of people feel emboldened saying those things because, frankly, a lot of people at the top are saying very, very similar things, right? Uh, it's, a, it's shaped to be a little bit more palatable, the messaging is a little bit different, but the mission is the same. And I know because this is the ball that we started to roll 30 years ago. Now, as far as the casual comments, um, you know, I don't engage in them. Uh, if I do engage, I engage in a very compassionate way. Um, and uh, you know, it's hard for people to shut down compassion. However, if you attack back, you're going to see it just go on and on and on, and you'll see the polarization go even wider. Uh, have honest conversations with people. Don't necessarily challenge their narrative. Just be the message. Be the message that you want them to be. So if you want them to be understanding, you have to show understanding. If you want them to be compassionate or empathetic, that's something you have to do first. So that applies to strangers, and I think it applies you know, to people that might be family members that we block on social media sometimes. Uh, but I think that, that we have to establish that connection. We have to start by finding a middle ground and then go out and talk about all the, the difficult things. But we have to have these difficult and very awkward conversations. That's what's going to connect us again. Thank you, Sunny. Hi. Hi. Wow. Thank you. Cray. Um, I think. <laughs> two questions. One is about the five years, right, that there weren't a lot of details around. Like, yeah. I'm interested in, like, I would imagine there's relapses that happen with this sort of thing. I mean, so much of this is like an addiction to substance abuse and things of that nature. So, you know, you talked about success rates with your own people. So I'm just curious, like, you know, what happened to you personally as well as like what you see with some of your, you know, the people that you're counseling. I've never the, been asked that question. That's really um, a good question. The second question I have is within that time frame too, and then as you were coming out of this, like clearly this is, you know, you deserve all the credit of getting yourself out of where you were. But I would imagine there was someone yeah. that helped you. You didn't really talk a lot, a lot about people. that. So if there's like one person in particular, just yeah. just to kind of understand the support or, you know. Sure. Yeah. First of all, those five years were really dark. I mean, I didn't have a steady job. I didn't 
date. Uh, you know, I was still very adamant about being there for my children that I saw every weekend, but other than that, the rest of those five days, I was deteriorating. I got into drugs and alcohol, and, and uh, I was just really not treating myself with a whole lot of respect. I was really ashamed of what I had been through, and I didn't think that I deserved happiness. So I was really going out of my way to be extra kind and extra compassionate to other people, but I was completely ignoring myself. Um, Second question, there were a lot of people. Uh, it wasn't just one instance. There were so many people. It was like I was a pinball in a pinball machine. It was like everybody that I touched somehow would impart on me some sort of like wisdom. Uh, and I would take just a, like a, a nugget from everybody, and eventually I was able to put them all together. Um, when I stopped the ego, when I stopped thinking and started feeling, um, that's really when I connected with who I was and with the innocence that I lost at 14 years old. Uh, because I went from you know, this 13 and a half year old kid to this 14 year old monster, essentially. I was doing things that not only most adults don't do, but most people wouldn't do. Um, so it was a very difficult time. And leaving that, uh, I didn't have any relapses because one, I couldn't go back. Once I left, you know, there's no going back. Uh, and two, I knew how it made me feel when I was there. And even though I was going through a miserable period and I, you know, was, it was a very dark time, I still felt some peace that I wasn't involved in that. And I knew I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to stir up those feelings or go back into that confusion. I knew at that time it was not something I wanted to do. Um, and pretty quickly after those five years, I started the ball rolling on doing some of the work that I do now and writing my book. And writing my book, I tell you, for 10 years, really, it was pretty cathartic. It was pretty therapeutic for me to, to even think about some of the things that I had forgotten about myself. Uh, so it was almost like self-therapy for me to, to write the book. Um, it was a tough time. I'm glad I made it past that. Yes? Hi, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask two questions. One is like, when you saw really bad things happen within your group, for example, that girl that got attacked and was a member, how did you explain that to yourself? Like, okay, like this is right and I want to yeah. be the leader of this group? Or like, how do other people do that as well? And then two, I know you're saying you first got into contact with different types of people in your record store, mm -hmm. but I really have, like I come from a very like white Catholic country and I still feel like I was always exposed to like so many different people. Mm -hmm. And I'm just always on the edge of like, uh, some people who are kind of like promoting these hate speeches at the same time are like hiring people of different races and stuff like this. So I'm kind of confused as to how that comes about. Well, it's a, it's a self-exclusion. So even though you may, I mean, I went to high school with people of all different colors and even though I had access to these people, I isolated myself from them. I didn't want to engage with them because I was afraid. I never admitted it at that time, but I was afraid. Uh, and because I was 14 years old when I got in, when I was younger, I never really had access to that kind of diversity. Um, and certainly when I was 14 to the time I was 22, I kept myself out of that. It was a, it was a choice that I made not to engage with people until, you know, because I wanted to be a good businessman or because I was greedy or whatever, I was forced to engage with these people. And then I was like, ah. They don't fit what's in my head. They don't fit what's in my heart. This is not what I, my reality is not real. And that's what helped me build that bridge. Um, I forgot your other question. What was your other question? Sorry, I was talking a lot. Uh, but my first question was around when there was like acts of violence, how did you describe that to yourself that that's okay? Or like anybody in these yeah. types of groups really? Well, we detached ourselves from that too. Uh, when we hurt somebody, we weren't hurting a human, because we had been so conditioned and we conditioned each other to think and feel that the people we were hurting were almost like an inanimate object, like a, like a parasite or a cockroach or a piece of paper that you could crumple up and throw away. So that's how we were able to deal with what we were doing, is we completely detached ourselves. It became us against the other, and the other didn't matter. All that mattered to us was us. Uh, because we didn't have, we weren't able to humanize them because we never interacted with them. 
they see, you know, it was like almost like a, a psychological cutoff, like a wall that we had built. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until I had those connections with people that I realized I didn't want to hurt them anymore, that I considered them equals, or in many cases even better, many cases better than me. I read Christian's book. I highly recommend reading it because he does really detail out um, where he was at that moment in his life. And um, it was one of the most transformative books that I've ever read. Um, so I just really encourage everyone to do so. I had the opportunity to interview Christian afterwards, actually, for a book that I'm writing. Um, and one thing that, um, well, many, many things stuck with me after that conversation. Um, but one thing really did, um, in which you talked about, you know, a lot of these people within these organizations and hate groups live in a reality that's entirely separate from our own, especially in this world that we live in here at Google where we're extremely blessed. Can you speak a little bit more about that, um, especially because, you know, it's likely that all of us have an unconscious bias. Oh, sure. You know, towards some different, sure. even individual. Yeah, thank you for that. It's good to see you again. Um, there are two different realities, and I think you know maybe November after November we started to realize that um, that there are these two sometimes very separate tracks with not a whole lot of bridges that cross over, and we tend to stay in our in our comfort zones and our you know our bubbles or our silos and and uh, not really cross over because it makes us uncomfortable. Know that when we hear them and think it's ridiculous, how can somebody think that? they also think that about us. Those are the two realities. They think, how can somebody want diversity? That's white genocide. The more people you allow in that are not white, the white people go away. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? But there are two very distinct realities, and we really need to build, if we ever hope to eliminate some of this or to change people's perspective, we have to be willing to build that bridge and have very, very uncomfortable you know, discussions with uh, them. And sometimes they're people that you know, we love and we think we understand, but when we hear something like that, we're, who, we think, who is that person? I don't know that person. Well, that person's the same person. They've just had something appear in their path that changed their direction at some point, that pothole. Um, just you know, listen. I think more than you speak. People don't necessarily like to be talked to, they like to be heard. So, you know, listen, but also hold people accountable. You know, it's important to do that, you know? If you hear something that you know is, is not right, and, or an action that you clearly know is hurting somebody else, including that person, hold that person accountable, but also listen, because that'll give you the clues on how to build that bridge. Yes. Hi, thank you for what you're doing. It's thank very you. powerful and important. What can we as a society and as individuals do to help those marginalized teens or even younger? You know, is there a way we can engage with the youth from an early age, even elementary school, to help teach them empathy and tolerance yeah. um, to help prevent this? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, and I think that you answered partly your question is we really need to be there for young people as early as possible from the day they're born uh, to not only teach them empathy, but to provide them with opportunity and to amplify their passions, right? I just said young people don't like to be talked to, they like to be heard. We need to listen to young people. They have something important to say, they're passionate. Their ideas may not be completely formed, they may not have the experience that maybe some of us have, but we need to be there to amplify their passions, to really listen to them. Because I could tell you, if I was 14 years old and somebody would have came up to me and said, hey, you're a really good artist, or you know, you're a pretty good baseball player, let's find a way for you to do those things that you love to do, I would have gone that way. I mean, I, I wasn't like aspiring to be a hater. I came from a family that was the victim of racism. When they came to this country, they were the victims of prejudice. It wasn't a part of my upbringing. I didn't even know what racism was. Um, you know, let me just use kind of a, a theory that I have. I think that we should feed young people from the day they're born ethnic food. 
different food instead of chicken nuggets and grilled cheese sandwiches because maybe if they're not afraid of diverse foods, they won't grow up to be afraid of diverse people. Um, I think fathers are so, so important to young men because what I'm seeing is that so many of these young men that are joining these movements are doing that because they don't have a connection to their father, because they're trying to be something for their father. Uh, and there are a lot of studies about masculinity and extremist movements that make a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, so there are lots of things we can do. We can you know, do something kind in a small way that if everybody just does that extra kind thing in their life, well, that's billions of kind things that happen every day that are extra, right? Hold the door, say hi to somebody. Instead of looking you know, at your pixels, look at you know, eyes when you're walking down the street. There's so many things that we can do that really don't take a lot of effort that I think would really go a long way. But opportunity for young people is so important. Instead of you know, after school daycare, maybe we should set up after school incubators for young people as young as six years old to you know, start playing around with things that um, may take them down a better path. Okay. So thank you, Christian. Always a pleasure. Ah, uh, thank you. To your talk. Um, in speaking with people that have very different beliefs as you, you said hold them accountable, but you don't want to be combative. You know that they're fueled with fake facts, but I know personally, I probably don't know all of the exact facts unless I Google and try to find three other resources like immediately. So, do you have any techniques in how to? listen, but also hold them accountable without being confrontational with your own like gut and sure. moral compass. Well, I'll tell you about my two-hour conversation with Richard Spencer. Um, we hardly talked about ideology. I asked him about his father. <laughs> uh, I asked him about the kind of things that he likes to do, and I listened. And when he would drift into that ideological space and say something that you know, was a no-no, I would tell him that was a no-no. And I would hold him accountable for that by saying, that's not something that I believe in, and I would appreciate it if you didn't say that. And you'd see kind of like the way he would talk shift, and he would move on to something else, and that would, like, he'd started to go like talk about how he wanted to be a theater major, and, and when we were walking out, somebody had come up to us and said, hey, can I tell you how weird it is that you guys are both standing here and right next door we're doing a rehearsal for a uh, performance of Cabaret? And, I, and his face lit up and we started to talk about theater and all these things and it's just hold them accountable in a non-confrontational way but still keep that dialogue open. It would be kind of like talking to your child, right? You, you wouldn't, well. <laughs> But you're not going to go off and, and scream at your kids and be angry at them and tell them you know, that they're stupid and wrong or whatever, because that's not the way you would handle your kids. It's almost like we have to have those kid gloves, but at the same time, like, no, that's not right. And then show them what is right and have that conversation. It may not agree, and it may take a long time, but that's the way we're going to get through to people. I guarantee you, but arguing is not the way to do it. I don't know that any... You know, aside from a, a, a debate, a structured debate, uh, I don't know that arguing with anybody or going to war or having a fight has ever changed anybody's mind. I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you to Josh for having me. It was a real pleasure. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and talk to anybody um, afterwards. Uh, it's really good to be here again, and thank you so much. Thank you, Google. I appreciate it. <laughs>